So today we're going to look at encoder decoder models and then attention. I hope I get through everything. Um, and we're specifically going to look at these um, architectures and they're actually relatively simple, um, but we're going to look at them in the context of machine translation. Um, I should say with these things, I won't talk about backprop at all, but backprop works exactly the same in these models as it did with the feedforward neural networks and the RNNs that we looked at yesterday. But the nice thing about PyTorch and TensorFlow is if you can make a forward pass through your model and you use standard blocks, then you're done, right? Um, because um, PyTorch or TensorFlow will then figure out the gradients for you and figure out how to wiggle things to get a lower loss. Yes? Okay, cool. So we'll be looking at um, these models in the context of machine translation. Um, so I think most of you have probably used um, Google Translate before. Um, it works surprisingly well uh, over the last few years. It's got a lot better, I think because of, of neural models. Um, so there are, you've got two examples. The one is in, uh, from English to Afrikaans, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Okay, it messes up, it gets the last words wrong. Long clear than a status tells or fair fair. Okay, it needs another word there. But it's still pretty good. And then I've got no idea whether the Easy Corsa is correct, but I can put in an Afrikaans sentence and get out an uh, um, Easy Corsa sentence. So, machine translation, the goal is I've got a sentence in a source language, an input sentence. Um, so this, this is normally called um, the source language and then I want to um, output that sentence into uh, a target language. Okay, translate it into a target language. Okay, um, this was in the uh, past done with very big complicated probabilistic um, more generative models actually uh, and, and they called that kind of way of doing machine translation Statistical machine translation. I'm only telling you this because you might come across these terms. So they call it statistical machine translation, SMT. Okay, um, and then in around 2014, neural models really started to pick up, and they kind of distinguish between this current wave of models by calling them neural machine translation models, NMT. So if you see NMT, you know it's um, neural models um, to distinguish them from what came before, which was SMT. Um, and um, we will use NMT as our kind of case study to look at encoder-decoder models and attention. Encoder-decoder models or sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, they're used for a lot more than just machine translation. So just keep that in the back of your head, but we'll look at the specific example of machine translation. Okay, so we'll just jump straight in there is a, a little encoder-decoder model for, um, for machine translation. And I'll, I'll just slowly step through the steps. There's a bunch of stuff not on the diagram, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So here at the bottom, we've got our input. Just move this up a little bit. Here we've got our input, which is in the source language source language, okay, um, in this case Afrikaans, sorry I only speak two languages so all the examples are like that, I mean you can read Dutch and German as well if you understand Afrikaans but I've just used Afrikaans example, so we've got the input, okay, and then the translated sentence, I do not know where I got these sentences from, is um, the output, the ideal output is he threw me, okay. And this is in the target language, which is English in this case. Okay. And what we will do is we will pass the input language through what we call an encoder RNN. Okay. And this is exactly like the RNNs that we looked at before. When I say RNN now, in your head, you can substitute that for GRU, LSTM, whatever. RNN is just now a general term for one of those uh, recurrent um, architectures, okay? Um, you pass your input sentence through the RNN, feeding in um, stuff at every time step, and then you get the last uh, hidden representation. This hidden representation is really special 
because what you're going to do is you're going to use that as the first kind of initialization state for the decoder RNN. Okay, so here we've got the decoder RNN. Okay, and the decoder RNN, its purpose in life is to actually output the um, sentence in the target language. Okay, so um, it takes this vector here and it conditions, it takes it in as its first hidden representation, basically the initialization of the decoder RNN, and then it feeds it through and then it has to output that um, target sentence. Um, so normally what happens is um, you kind of feed the decoder RNN one time step at a time, so you initialize it with this vector. Let me just talk about this vector for a little bit more. The, the goal of that single red vector there, this last time step here, is to summarize the entire input sentence into one fixed dimensional, or like 100 dimensional vector that captures everything that goes on here. And you take that red vector and that red vector should really tell the decoder, listen, um, go through the steps and output everything that's summarized in my red vector in my latent embedding, this kind of, you can think of it almost as a sentence embedding, right? Because it summarizes that whole, that whole thing. Okay, does that make sense? It's quite intense, right? You're relying on, it's not an easy task. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, now in the decoder RNN, you do things one slight time step at a, at a time as you do with the RNN. So you would say, you would start and say, I'm at the start of the sentence. Take the summary of this whole um, input sentence and then output the first word for me. Thank you. Got the first word. At training time, what you then do is you you have at if you have training sentences, you actually know the targets here, right? So the input output pair. So at training time, what you would do is you would know what the first word is. So at the, at the second second time step, you feed in this first word and you tell it, listen, output the second word. Okay. The third time step, you input the second word and tell me. Uh, and ask it out with the third word and so on. Okay, so that's what happens at, at training time up to the end of a sentence. Okay, does that make sense more or less? I mean, you should be able to implement the forward pass through this thing by hand in NumPy if you wanted to, if you know all, all the little steps. There are some things missing here, so probably here at the input. I fudged over the details here, but you probably have an embedding layer here that um, takes a one-up representation of the word and finds the uh, embedding for the word hi. Okay? And the same here, here, you probably have an English embedding layer which looks up the word through and inputs uh, the embedding for the word through and passes that on. And the other thing that I fudged over was you probably have uh, here it's not, it doesn't directly go from the hidden decoder representation to the word. You probably have something like a, let's just write that there, like something like a softmax, um, softmax, which is captured in this little arrow here, which tells you how to output the word. Okay, so we've um, skipped a few things, but um, you understand how it works. Will everyone be able to implement a forward pass through this thing for a vanilla RNN in NumPy mm -hmm. with a week? Okay, I'll give you a week's time, you'll be able to do it. All of you, within a week, you'll be able to, okay. right? If I give you a week of playing around with NumPy and just a normal RNN, not a LSD in you are, you'll be able to do it. Yes, yes, yes? Um, just a question. Is, is this uh, incredibly not decoder model trained on both uh, the input and the, the translated sentences, or can you uh, train the encoder and decoder separately? Um, or is that just a bad idea? <laughs> I feel like it's a bad idea to, to train them separately, but... No, it's not. It's actually not a bad idea. So, if you want to do machine translation, a, tr a training item, uh, one training instance, will have s source and target. Yeah. You'll have parallel sentences for source and target. Okay? Um, and you'll need that, which is painful to get. What some people did at some point was they would actually uh, initialize this thing as a language model. So you can train the English decoder just on English text. So then you don't need parallel sentences, right? Um, you, you will need parallel sentences at some point if you want to do machine translation. But the problem is parallel sentences is tough to get, 
right? You can't get parallel sentences just from browsing the interwebs because it's normally just one language. Um, but what you can do is you can scrape the whole internet for all, all of the English, all English on, on the interweb and then train this thing as a language model, just trying to predict the next word. And then you initialize this thing with your English RNN language model and then you fine tune the rest. So then at least if uh, it starts at a good point, then uh, you're kind of happy. So you can do that. And would you do the same with the encoder or would you... You can. I, I should emphasize people don't actually do this very often anymore. Okay, but you can... Um, with a new wave of models, they do something differently. They still do pre-training, um, which we'll talk a little bit about. But um, you can do the same with the uh, with the encoder or in basically initializing the weights. Again, it's a form of transfer learning. Train on one task, language modeling, and then use that task to initialize and then fine tune a model for a different task. Machine translation in this case. Yeah, but it's a good question. Any more questions? I want you to ask one question. I told you what to do during training time. Okay, at training time, I have a parallel sentence of input and output. But at test time, when you're actually running this model, you don't have the output, right? Obviously not. That's what you're trying to get. So you need to decide how you're actually going to run the decoder. So at test time, you take in your source sentence, which you obviously do have. You get your red vector here. Okay, and then you condition the decoder on this red vector. But then what you would do is you would say start of sentence. That's also something you have. You know that the sentence starts with the start of sentence. Okay? You would push the red thing and the start of sentence embedding through, through your network, get the first hidden representation, pass it through the softmax and get the output. Okay? And then what you would do is you would look, this thing is a vector over your vocabulary, and you would just take the element that's maxed in that vector. Okay? And then that's the thing that you would pass on to the next time step, okay? And you would continue to do this until your output, until the arc max is the end of sentence token, and then you would stop. Do you think that's a good plan? It's a reasonable plan. It's actually not the best plan, but um, because you could screw up, okay? And if you make a, so if you make a mistake here, the model isn't perfect, then you would actually propagate that mistake on to the next time steps. And the model will go on, not realizing it made a mistake and it, and, and it will continue in that way. And we'll talk about that um, in just a little bit. Okay, but the basic, I mean, encoder decoder, if you know about RNNs, then you know what this is. It's two RNNs stacked together. Okay, not on top of each other, like a little bit sideways from each other. Okay, makes sense? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, excellent. Um, Okay, I should say I talk about encoder-decoder architecture. A lot of other people will talk about sequence-to-sequence -sequence models, which normally refers to the same thing. Okay. Um, yeah.